Uh, I'm going to talk generally about the Great Lakes uh, Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, or GLADLS, and Chris is going to talk specifically about its application in Lake Erie. Uh, lots of people have uh, contributed to my understanding of acoustic telemetry, and that includes uh, Chris Holbrook and Tom Binder and Todd Hayden, Daryl Hondor, Chris Vandergood even, and Nancy Nate, uh, represented by the agencies. Uh, listed there. The, uh, a number of core agencies are involved in GLADLS and specifically uh, really the originator is the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and then uh, particularly then with strong funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We are also a part of the Ocean Tracking Network which is a global network. Uh, it's housed at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia and where there are Great Lakes node. Uh, just very briefly, most of you probably know what acoustic telemetry is, but uh, this is my one slide on it. It's uh, you put a tag in a fish, that tag emits a unique uh, acoustic signal unique to that particular fish. That, and it transmits every two, three minutes. If that fish then passes by a receiver here shown uh, anchored to the bottom, uh, then that transmission will be recorded for that unique fish and then a date and time stamp is uh, placed on the, uh, on the record file. And then of course you know where the, where the transmitter is in the lake. So what's the differences between acoustic tags and traditional tagging? Uh, first, uh, certainly with traditional tags like anchor tags, coat of wire tags, or jaw tags, the tagging can be very rapid. Whereas with acoustic tags, you have to do surgeries and that requires four to five minutes per fish. Uh, recovery of the tag is typically dependent on, on a fishery or some type of agency assessment. Whereas tag recovery for acoustic tags is dependent on, on those receivers that you place out. But you have to deploy them and you've got to retrieve those receivers. I think most importantly from a statistical manner, the tag recovery effort on traditional tags is typically dependent uh, or is variable over space and time. It depends on where you have your assessment or where your fisheries are being prosecuted. In contrast, with acoustic tags, your tag recovery effort can be controlled both in space and time and those receivers are listening 24-7. If you put sentinel tags out in adjacent to your receivers, then you can actually estimate, and those sentinel tags will be emitting a signal like every 10 minutes, you can actually then calculate what your detection probability on your receivers are over the life of your study. Uh, tip with traditional tags, typically you have an observation at the time of the tagging, you take the species length, weight, that type of thing, and then again at recapture in the fishery, so only two times. Whereas with uh, acoustic tags, you get repeated observations on the same individuals. Uh, and typically we have thousands of observations per individual fish in our projects. Shedding, especially for something like an anchor tag, not true for coated wire tags, is higher uh, than what we see with acoustic tags. And la last is really a difficult thing to discuss because there's also issues like the value of the information. Certainly for uh, something like an anchor tag, the tagging is lower cost than acoustic tags, but if you looked at coated wire tags, uh, and you got a, an auto fish mark trailer that's worth more than a million dollars, it gets kind of complicated to talk about what's more expensive. But with, if you maybe compare to anchor tags, uh, acoustic tags might be a hundred times more expensive. Uh, what types of management questions could you ask with acoustic tagging? And some of the things I thought up just at the front end was you could do hatchery evaluations. You could put tags in hatchery fish and wild fish and compare their behaviors. Uh, there's new tags that are coming out now that if you say put a, that new tag in a hatchery fish and recently stocked fish like a lake trout and it got eaten by another fish, it's the process of digestion changes that tag to transmit a different type of signal so that you can tell when that predation occurred. So you can talk about when and where predation occurs on hatchery fish. For harvest management, 
Uh, with the right design, you can ask the, co the question is of which populations contribute to harvest. And that's really a direct estimate of mixed, uh, mixed stock analysis as compared to doing it through genetics. For invasive species like the Asian carps or for sea lamprey, you can uh, ask questions of which streams are used for spawning or what stream channels are used for migration. And that could lead you then to, uh, say, a strategy of trapping for control. Classical fishery uh, management requires information about population dynamics. So what's the population's annual survival rate? Uh, and you can use uh, Cormac, uh, Cormac Jolly Seber models to do that. You can ask, is there more than one population within a body of water? Uh, where do the fish spawn? And it, that would be, you'd have to combine it with something like egg mats or uh, scuba to confirm the spawning. Uh, do fish return to sites of previous spawning, spawning site fidelity? What is the timing of post-spawning movements? Do they, are they aggregated after they've spawned and thus may be vulnerable to a fishery or do they rapidly disperse and, and less vulnerable to fisheries? Are movement patterns different by stock, sex, and age? Now, uniquely with these tags, you get individual data, repeated observations, and you can get even probe more into those population characteristics. Does more than one post-spawning life history strategy exist? This was done in the Titabawasi walleye population up in Lake Huron, and we found, indeed, there were three life history strategies for that one spawning stock. And with that individual data, you can say, well, do they show the same post-spawning behavior? And in fact, in Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron, Titabawasi population, they showed those three behaviors, but the same fish showed the same behavior from year to year. Fish left the bay, some turned right, some turned left. But the fish that turned right always turned right from year to year. So pretty inf interesting information. <coughs> So what are the challenges? You, maybe you want to start a project or your agency wants to start an acoustic telemetry project. What are some of the challenges they're going to be faced? Certainly for me, it was new technology and it required lots of learning uh, and some experience in the field. You got surgeries, receiver deployment techniques, and retrieval techniques is particularly important, and then data analysis. So the question might be is how can you tap others that already have this knowledge and experience. There is that upfront expense, like receivers, are fairly costly. Uh, but, you know, again, when you talk about costs, there are some in Lake Erie who have argued that more has been learned in three years of acoustic telemetry than with 20 years of traditional tagging. So you have to, might have to trade off what those expenses are in three years, the type of information you're getting versus costs over 20 years. So it's, it's not a straightforward thing, but nevertheless, if you're doing a project, you want to know how to reduce costs. Tag detections, you put out receivers for a project, and your receivers will record tags from other people. And other projects, their receivers will record your tags going by their receivers. So how can you trade your tag detections back and forth among projects easily? Data management analysis, each of our projects and all of our fishes have millions of detections. Uh, the Lake Sturgeon project between Lake Erie and Lake Huron, the median detection on a Lake Sturgeon in that project, we have over 200 sturgeon with acoustic tags there, is 2,600 observations per individual. The max was 113,000 per individual for the one individual. So how do you manage data sets like that? How do you filter the data? How do you analyze data? So what is GLADLS? Well, it's a network of researchers in the Great Lakes Basin and specifically looking to develop relationships, to develop partnerships, and to allow easily to be able to share fish detection data among projects. So if we go back, if you were starting a new project and we went back to those questions that I highlighted, uh, how can you tap others who already have knowledge? Well, GLADLS is a network of researchers that's out there available to help. And it ranges just from simple consultation. We've done this particularly with Black Bay walleye population up in Lake Superior to actually being co-investigators to serving on graduate student uh, committees. 
What about those costs? How can you reduce them? Well, uh, GLaDOS has purchased some capital investments in that in terms of receivers. Uh, they are deployed, it seems, mostly in Erie these days, but we also do have receivers in Ontario and uh, Huron. We hope to plan, uh, expand out into Lake Michigan and Lake Superior next year. But and typically, individual project costs pay for acoustic tags and for the field work. Uh, in addition to reducing costs, GLaDOS has uh, an arrangement with Vemco, a primary supplier of the equipment, for a discount. Tag detections, how can you share tag detections back and forth? Well, GLaDOS manages a basin-wide database of receiver locations and tag detections that then can be queried for your tagged fish. And data management analysis, how do you do that? Uh, well, GLaDOS, again, has a, has a network of researchers now with uh, considerable experience. The group up at Hammond Bay is particularly, Hammond Bay Biological Station and USGS uh, up on Lake Huron has particularly uh, six years of, of experience doing this. They can provide as consultants, serve as co-authors, and actually provide data analyses. And we hope on our GLaDOS website we'll have a library of R scripts that provide for the common data management functions and analyses and these type of data sets that we hope will be up by May. So our current status, we have 107 researchers registered with GLaDOS representing 35 projects. 32 species have been tagged, over 5,000 uh, fish released. Uh, for over 4,000 receiver deployments at over 1,600 receiver stations, and you can see this prol <coughs> proliferation there in Lake Erie. So uh, you, you guys are pretty well covered. Uh, in our database, this is the basin-wide database that we have in, for the Great Lakes. We have 168 million total tag detections, but if you strip out the tag detections that come from the sentinel tags that I mentioned earlier, that are for uh, receiver probability detections, uh, 97 million of those are matched to fish IDs. So what's the benefits of belonging to GLaDOS? Well, uh, certainly from my experience as a researcher, this is the most collaborative and cooperative bunch of researchers I've ever worked with. Just it's just absolutely outstanding, and if you get into this type of work, I think you'll find lots of help out there. It does allow coordination to optimize available resources like receivers, and it also tries to ensure that uh, no single project interferes with other projects. In terms of, st uh, we provide study design assistance, try to emphasize strong hypothesis-driven study designs, with clearly articulated research objectives uh, so that you can learn more than just where a fish goes on a particular day, but also that the information will be valuable so that you can apply it to policy and fishery management. Data sharing is flexible and easy. Receiver locations and detections are uploaded by you. As they become available, you maintain control over who can access detections of your tagged fish and we have a data manager full-time, Dr. Nancy Nate, up at uh, the Hammond Bay Biological Station. She's an absolutely outstanding person to work with, and you would find her to be just an enormous help. Uh, the advantage of being a part of GLaDOS is then it's not just your receivers out there listening for your tagged fish. All the receivers are listening. And you expand then the geographic scope of your project across that entire network and you get the results back to you in a standard export data file. We have an annual meeting every year, usually in February, maybe early March sometimes, but this gives you a chance to float out a late, latest project designs and get some feedback, or you can talk about ongoing projects or talk about completed projects. Probably most importantly is it allows you to meet investigators that are using this type of technology and uh, develop those relationships. And what's the cost of membership? You know, what's the subscription rate here? Uh, nothing. All you got to do is register. And if you coordinate with us on purchases from Vemco, you get the, the Vemco discount as well. So uh, I will now 
summarize uh, in terms of topics of acoustic telemetry. Um, there's lots of things you can do. You can do hatchery evaluations, population ecology, and dynamics, and you can get right down to individual behavior patterns. Uh, in terms of uh, the information, it is different in that you get repeated observations of the same tagged individual over potentially broad spatial and temporal scales. I didn't talk about 2D or fine scale information, but there are ways of doing that too, where you can actually get tracks of, of uh, fish uh, moving through space. Uh, challenges certainly are in the learning as well as data analysis. And again, Glottis is out there to help if you're interested. So I'll turn this uh, over to Chris, who always seeks to uh, find his advice from the highest of sources. So Chris. I'm just kidding, I'll put it up here, thanks. Okay, so Chuck has provided some really good uh, examples of the GLaDOS network and some of the questions that are being asked by fisheries managers and biologists in the Great Lakes. And so for my portion of the talk, what I want to do is walk you through some of the uh, projects and how we're using this technology in Lake Erie to answer uh, pressing management needs. So between 1990 and 2007, approximately 17,000 uh, walleye were jaw tagged in the Lake Erie waters. Um, what we have up here on the top graph is the theoretical movement of a jaw tagged fish. And what we um, learned from this fish is two things. When it was ca released, when it was captured. We have very little idea of what's going on between those two points. So it could, that could be weeks later or it could be 10 or 15 years later, which we've seen uh, with some of the uh, jaw tag returns. Now, provided a fish is harvested and reported, we are able to estimate exploitation rates and get some understanding of what the movement of that fish might have been while it was out at liberty. Um, however, that fish is really left to be unobserved while it's out at liberty. And so we have to use these dead recovery models to estimate the other parameters, such as natural mortality. So it's really the parameters we estimate are contingent upon fish being uh, returned. So what have we learned from this long tag, this long-term tagging study? Well, what we've learned is, in some respects, a lot. We've gotten approximately 9,000 recaptures during this time period, and so that's a lot of data points. And so we've been able to estimate time, region, and fishery-specific instantaneous, rate, instantaneous rates of fishing mortality, region-specific uh, natural mortality rates, as well as estimate region-specific movement rates. So some of the drawbacks, as Chuck alluded to in his talk, was that uh, these returns are uh, dependent upon fisheries to return them and report them. And this is particularly problematic in an area uh, such as Lake Erie, where we have variable fishing efforts uh, throughout the lake. Here we have a heat map of Lake Erie depicting you know, the, the walleye effort in 2015. So uh, this effort, the effort for the commercial and recreational fisheries has been standardized for each of the fisheries. And what we see is this high fishing effort in the western basin. And then essentially as you get into the central, I mean, I'm sorry, high fishing effort in the western basin, then as you move into the central and eastern basins, uh, effort declines. Um, and so, um, what we can do then is as we overlay this theoretical movement of a, a tagged walleye, we see this fish moving in and out of areas of high and low fishing effort during the course of its year. That in turn is going to increase or uh, bias potentially the catchability of that fish. So you can see here where a system that's dependent upon fishery returns could result in some biased uh, uh, inferences if you're uh, re uh, relying strictly on this type of information. And as Chuck alluded to earlier, it's, we're kind of limited with respect to how many times we see that fish. So because we're unable, uh, with, the current, with the previous tagging study, the jaw tagging study, we were unable to estimate uh, a variety of parameters. And specifically, we were unable to estimate time varying uh, parameters. The parameters that were estimated other than the instantaneous fishing mortality rates were over the entire study period. So from 1990 to 2000, 
2007. That's a fairly long time period when you're talking about movement rates as well as natural mortality rates. We're also able, unable to parse out things like uh, stock and age-specific movements and stock and age-specific natural mortality rates and stock and age-specific fishing mortality rates. And these are particularly important for understanding what your fishery is doing or the fish population is doing as you uh, conduct stock assessment modeling. So essentially our data is limited or our inferences are limited to the, delay to the data that we are catching. So in response to uh, uh, you know, trying to come up with pr uh, estimating the parameters in a more thorough way. We initiated this uh, acoustic telemetry projects in 2011. Um, and so given the constraints associated with estimating the important population dem demographic parameters, uh, in 2011 a broad scale telemetry study was in initiated in Lake Erie. The first study was initiated in the Maumee River in conjunction with a study that was also going on simultaneously up in Lake Huron. All told, uh, in Lake Erie, we've uh, released approximately 800 acoustic transmitted walleye uh, dating back to 2011. As you can see here, the preponderance of them have been in the Western Basin, including the Detroit River. And in 2015, we expanded out into the Eastern Basin. Um, and here we have just a, 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 an idea of where these receivers that Chuck were talking, was talking about were dispersed throughout uh, Lake Erie. Now, just as a disclaimer, these are not all annual receivers. Some of these represent seasonal uh, receiver locations to address specific questions. So I guess the, 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 our hope and the, our, our main point of this is that telemetry can provide better answers than traditional tagging studies because of uh, the way the technology operates. First, the status of the fish is not dependent upon uh, fishery returns. Because we're allowing the receiver to tell us what's happening to a fish rather than fisher's behavior, we have more confidence and we have a better idea of whether or not fish that go unseen by commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen reporting if they're alive or dead. As long as this fish is still moving and active and moving around the lake, we're able to tell that this fish is alive. Also, um, what this type of approach is, is robust to a variable fishing effort because the receivers then become your recoveries. Fish are repeatedly observed through time, and so um, we're able to have either boil detection summaries down to, you know, this fish was seen in October, all the detections seen on October, or every two minutes the transmitter goes off, that becomes another detection event. So it's really unlimited in terms of how many detection events we have um, for fish using this acoustic telemetry approach. And then no data, like not seeing a fish is actually very valuable data with this acoustic telemetry approach because you can infer then that either the fish has either died because it's no longer moving around or potentially that um, the fish was caught but the tag wasn't reported. We've had very few instances of transmitter uh, uh, failures so we're fairly confident that uh, if a fish is out there and it's moving around we're going to detect it. So here's a graph. I apologize for the poor labeling of the axes. Whoever created this for me, I didn't feel right telling them at the last minute, hey, can you increase the font size? But basically the way this works is along the x-axis is time. Beginning, I believe it's in uh, 2000 and, mm, let's see, 13. And then on the y-axis is basically each of the receiver arrays spread throughout Lake Erie. The important thing here, what I want to show you is that this fish was tagged in 2013 on the reefs. It moved into the western basin, it moved out of the western basin into the west central basin, and then it returned right back to the reefs in 2014. The fish was harvested in the central basin during the late summer, early fall. So from this, we're able to infer site fidelity rates because we didn't see this fish showing up in any other known spawning areas where we have receivers in Lake Erie. And we're also able to look at the movement rates and timing of those movement rates as well as survival. And then we're able to parse this out into the demographics of the fish that we've tagged. Females, males, older fish, younger fish from this stock or that stock. So I talked a little bit about getting individual observations for a fish. And so here's a fish that was recaptured and each of the, the, the lighted up uh, <coughs> circles there represent where that fish was detected on a receiver. 
Well, if we take the transmitter data and pair it with this little I button data that's up there in the corner, it's a little button that logs temperature and depth, what we're, it, sorry, temperature and depth, we're able to reconstruct what thermal habitat this fish was occupying during the course of its life, as well as how deep it was. So the open circles there on those figures represent when that fish was located on a receiver. So we actually know where exactly that fish was, and we know what the depth of that fish was, as well as the temperature. So here again, we're able to look a lot more in depthly into the behavior of individual fish using these uh, electronic uh, tagging devices. <clears throat> So despite this extensive tagging effort, there's still, you know, of the jaw tagging program, there's still pressing management needs out there. One of the areas that's out there that we've identified is um, the relationship between spawners and recruit. It's very unclear for Lake Erie, which is, it, which is not atypical for fish populations, but we have a very poor idea of the relationship between spawners and recruits. Um, this is important because it helps us understand the underlying population di uh, dynamics of the Lake Erie walleye fishery, as well as it's used for evaluating different harvest policies, um, similar to what we did with the walleye management plan. You have to assume some type of spawner to recruit relationship for those modeling purposes. So here is the infamous shotgun pattern. So there's very low relationship between the spawner biomass, which is on the x-axis, and the number of recruits that are a product of that level of spawning biomass in a particular year through time. And the recruits here are measured as the number of age two recruits from the walleye task group model. So with this model, it assumes that natural mortality is constant across ages, across stocks, and through time. It assumes that females spawn once every year, they come back and they spawn, or they spawn every year, and then females exhibit some form of a high site fidelity. Um, what I have shown here is uh, some of the natural mortality rates that we've estimated from the, from the jaw tagging study. And so on the x-axis, we have region. Uh, regions one and two correspond to the western basin. Region three is the central basin. Region four would be the eastern basin. Region five would be the Huron Erie Corridor. And this was one of the primary objectives of the lake-wide tagging uh, study. So in a recent analysis, the models that accounted for age-specific rates were more plausible than those models where M was assumed to be constant across ages. However, because the tags were applied during the jaw tagging exercises, irrespective of um, ages, we're unable to really um, estimate age-specific rates because the preponderance of tags were placed on the older fish. And so there really just wasn't enough data in those younger fish to um, estimate age-specific mortality rates. So the blue dash line here on the, uh, on the figure there represents an M of 0.32, which is the current natural mortality rate uh, used by the walleye task group. And so what we see, depending upon the region you're in, the, uh, the mortali natural mortality rates estimated is variable. Here we have a similar graph that we, I've showed you before. And so what here we have is this fish, again, was tagged in 2013, moves out of the Western Basin, moves back to the reefs in 2014, moves out to the Central Basin, comes back to the reefs in 2015, and then finally was detected out in the Eastern Basin later on in its life. And so here I'm gonna play an an, uh, animation and I'm hoping this works. So Holly, would you please perform the magic? So here we have three fish that were tagged in the Sandusky, Basin, uh, Sandusky River, and through time you see them dispersing throughout the lake. Here we have midsummer, late fall, early fall, late fall, winter, and here we have January of 2015, February, March, April, May, and then finally this, the animation runs out in August. So I want to advance here. I've taken a screen capture here of this animation. So what we see here in 2015, in the, fall, in the spring of 2015, three of those fish, of these fish actually went back to the Sandusky River to spawn. However, three of those fish never returned back to the Sandusky River uh, during what we would consider the traditional spawning period. And so it happens to be that the three we picked for this example were in fact females. So this could be telling us one of, three th one of two things. Either those fish that never went back to the Sandusky River indeed skipped spawning that year, or two, they could have been spawning somewhere else where we didn't have receivers located. 
and while they still spawn, but they're exhibiting uh, low spawning site fidelity. So here's where we're using acoustic telemetry to really hone in on what's going on with the fish. And we can quantify these values. I think that's the bigger thing, is that we can start to quantify this and build this into our stock assessment models. So in either case, we may be overestimating the spawners uh, that are in, out in the population. Okay. So again, this is the same figure that we previously, uh, that I showed, the, the, gra the figure on the bottom. So here we have a fish again, released in 2013, showed back up on the reefs in 2014, but then, this fish disappeared. It was not reported as being harvested. It just stopped being detected on receivers. So this could be a fish that actually died due to spawning mortality. And so that's where we can start using these individual recovery histories and start parsing off the status to each of our tagged fish, alive or dead, and then poten potentially what's the cause of that. So we're, we've, um, GLaDOS has been supporting a couple students to work on this. The first is a postdoc student at Michigan, I mean, I'm sorry, the first is a doctorate student at Michigan State, Lisa Peterson. The other one is uh, a postdoc up at the University of Windsor. The overarching goal of these studies that are going on is to inform researchers and managers about the mortality dyna dynamics and differences between specific spawning populations. And then the overarching S objectives of these studies, of the people who are analyzing this data, is to estimate stock, age, and sex-specific fishing and natural mortality rates with an emphasis on natural mortality, as well as stock, age, and sex-specific movement rates, and as well as rates of idioparity, or how often does a fish return back to spawn. So we want to start quantifying these demographic parameters. So at the height of the fishery, when everybody's out there fishing, this site is fairly common, right? You see a bunch of guys, they have a few adult beverages in their hands, and they've come back from a successful day of fishing. But what we don't, while we know how many fish these guys are catching and where these guys are fishing, what we don't know is what stock these fish belong to. And Alex did a very good job of under, uh, explaining uh, stock contribution, so I won't go into it, but what we really need to know is how many of these are Sandusky fish? How many of these are Maumee? How many of these come from the reefs? And how many of these come from the Detroit River? So the, the second pressing uh, need, I would argue, for Lake Erie managers is getting a, a good handle on uh, stock contribution. Uh, what that means for movement of these different stocks, uh, the movement inter and intra lake movements, as well as differential uh, fishing mortality rates. As we saw previously today, Alex uh, had explained, the, the, the techniques used thus far, the uh, otolith microchemistry and genetics, have provided some answers, but they haven't really provided us the fine level of resolution we think we, we probably need uh, on Lake Erie. And so here's just a real quick hypothetical circumstances. So, circumstance, uh, example. So here we have what would be an average natural mortality rate for these four different stocks. If you tallied up the individual mortality, natural mortality rates, you have a natural mortality of 0.32. And this is assuming that all the stocks are contributing equally to the fishery. However, if we have assumed some different scenario where there's unequal contribution, what we see is that natural mortality rate can very easily drop because one or two stocks may contribute dis disproportionately to the harvest and in different areas of the lake than others. So historically, um, we've been, or previous, the, the, pre the, the projects to date that we've done on Lake Erie have relied upon one method of looking at the movements of and understanding the dynamics of uh, acoustically tagged water on Lake Erie, and that is we tag these fish on the spawning grounds and then we see where they go. This approach is good for estimating demographic rates of the population, such as movement and mortality. However, it's less than ideal because we have no idea what proportion individual stocks contribute to the different fisheries. And so into the future, what we're going to start uh, pursuing, and we have a couple projects uh, uh, being proposed, is where we actually tag the fish when they are mixed in the mixed fishery, and we see where they go back to to spawn in subsequent years. A pilot study was initiated in the summer of 2015, and there's additional work plan, uh, plan for both uh, the Western Basin, I believe, and the uh, Eastern Basin in 2016. That's me telling me I need to be done. Okay, so what we wanna do here is, 
In the future, we think we want to draw on the benefits of both tagging approaches, right? Jo uh, external traditional tags are really good because you can tag a lot of them. Telemetry tags are good because they can provide specific information. So one of the things that the Walleye Task Group, I understand, is, is considering is this combined approach where you're utilizing both external tags and these uh, new tags or telemetry tags in combination with maybe redistributing how the, re the receivers are deployed across Lake Erie. We feel as if we can do a better job of, you know, understanding the, the unique population dynamics of these fish. So I do want to take real, a, a few minutes real quickly to talk about how we're using acoustic telemetry for the restoration of native species in Lake Erie. And so we'll start off with lake trout. So Jim Markham showed you uh, this, this is the, the catch per unit effort of lake trout in Lake Erie through time. And what we've seen is this build up of adult lake trout in Lake Erie. And so the adult, the adult population is increasing. And they're important because they are considered to be the apex predator in the Eastern Basin. But they're not contributing, at least with natural recruits, to the population. All the fish thus far are, hatched, are, are hatchery raised fish. So we know very little about where these fish attempt to spawn and when they attempt to spawn. So we initiated, uh, initiated a pilot study in, the, in October of 2014 where we released, we caught uh, seven lake trout in the western basin and uh, we received uh, more funding uh, for a larger project in 2015 to examine the intralake movements of lake trout in Lake Erie and, and utilize, um, and we're going to evaluate the suspected lake trout spawning habitat uh, maps that were uh, developed by another project uh, back in 2010. And the third objective of this project is to determine the extent of the thermal habitat. What thermal habitats do lake trout occupy throughout the course of the year? We know what they do in the upper lakes, but Lake Erie is at the southernmost <coughs> limit, so likely it's very different than what, or at least partially different than what we see in fish in, say, Lake Superior or uh, Lake Huron. And so there was actually another follow-up pilot study that was conducted in uh, this previous fall. And so real quickly, this is what we thought was interesting. These were the fish that were tagged in the fall of 2014. And this is where they were detected on receivers in the fall of 2014. So one of those fish that we tagged along the Western Basin actually ran up the Detroit River, spent about a week up there during mid-November, and then moved back out to the central and then eastern basins. The other fish, uh, followed a northern path along uh, the Ontario shoreline and ended up in the eastern basin uh, later in the winter. If we take a look at the location of those same fish, but in the summer, what we see is they're constricted during a very, into a very narrow area. This period, the 21st of July through the 4th of August, represents a time where thermal stratification was set up. So it makes sense that these fish were compressed into the eastern basin. Come on. And then if we take a look at the fish that were tagged not only in 2014 but also in 2015, what we see is there's, there's this movement towards the near shore and also this movement towards the eastern of the lake. These are fish possibly looking out, for, looking for places to spawn, and we don't know, but this is what we're going to be doing in the future, using the telemetry data to answer some of these questions. Um, everybody's concerned about sea lamprey in uh, Lake Erie. Uh, Chris Holbrook up at the uh, Hammond Bay Biological Station has a project going on currently, and what it's designed to do is look at the effectiveness of the sampling for uh, sea lamprey. And so what they're doing is kind of unique, is that they're releasing these, these parasitic phase uh, lamprey into various parts of Lake Erie, and then they're taking a uh, look at where these lamprey end up going in, which, re uh, which rivers they end up going in trying to spawn. And so this um, should be provide some insights into uh, the behavior of these fish as well as inform future sampling efforts for uh, enumerating lamprey in Lake Erie. Um, real briefly, we've also worked with doing some pilot work with Lake Whitefish. We, we know that there's issues going on with Lake Whitefish and so we initiated a little study in 2014 in the fall with the help of some commercial fishermen down the west end collecting the fish for us and we're going to be answering some of the same questions that we've done for walleye. All right, well, I, I, I'll forego the summary slide. The one thing I do want to drive home is that 
we feel, or at least I feel, I probably should say I feel, pretty strongly that the acoustic telemetry isn't just a big hammer running around looking for nails to pound in. Acoustic telemetry, I think, really is, in some respects, the only tool that we can use to answer some of these questions. And I think that's uh, the utility of this. And um, so I, I would say that this is what the tool could be used for in the future, is answering these pressing and management needs. With that, I've pretty much impinged on your good graces for time-wise, so I will not take any questions.